What can I do? What mark could I leave on this world? I've always found it fascinating that we're both the hero of our own story, and yet we're also the most insignificant character within it. Now, I'd spent most of my life trapped behind this false sense of insignificance. But before I go into that, I'll go into where my story began. So my story began here in this small little mining colony called Parabadu. It's about 18 hours northeast of right here in Perth. It has a very small population. It's a very beautiful part of Australia in the Pilbara Desert. But unfortunately, it does have its fair share of problems, and it was a very difficult place for a child to grow up. When you look at what life was like there, uh, even using this particular study from the Western Australia Police in 2010 to 2011, you can look at every single measurable metric of crime, and almost every single one scored higher in the Pilbara Desert than anywhere else in the rest of Western Australia combined. If you can imagine what it's like for a child to grow up around that, and then you add another layer to it, where you've got a family who, uh, whose father uh, is dealing with mental illness, drug addiction, uh, domestic violence, then you add the other layer to it, where it's not just directed towards you, but you spend most of your childhood watching that directed towards your mother, towards your sister. Now think about, for one minute, how insignificant you're going to feel when you grow up, and that's been your life. Eventually, I moved over to Perth, uh, and when I was in high school, I was heavily subjected to bullying. That being said, I'm quite grateful that that happened because that led me to what would eventually be my salvation. My salvation was the library. That was the only place where I could get away from all of this. That was the only place I could feel safe. So I fell in love with learning, I fell in love with reading, I fell in love with educating myself. I eventually became the valedictorian of my high school. I won a large portion of the academic awards that were offered there. I got into university, I studied entrepreneurship. I went into entrepreneurship because through all of my life, and I think even still towards uh, my life today, I've always had this fire inside of me that was building up when I was that boy in Parabadu that wanted to make a mark with his life, that wanted to be significant one day. But would you believe me if despite all of that, all that I went through, all that I achieved, I still felt this big for my entire life. I felt like that small little boy in Parabadu, no matter where I went, no matter what I did. Within the second year of university, I started my technology startup, which uh, was a virtual reality company that operated in the education sector in, uh, in Australia and then eventually in Singapore. I was able to relocate over to Singapore. I'd built quite a comfortable life for myself, but I wasn't happy. And I still felt like that small little kid in Parabadu. And I began to keep questioning myself as to why this is. Why do I feel so insignificant? Look at what you're doing with your life. And the reason was that doubt that always held me back of what can I do I'd slowly began to challenge that, but I wasn't really making an impact with my life. Was I really saving lives? Was I really enriching the lives of everybody by making technology products? To an extent, yes, but not as much as I think my true potential would have allowed me to. So I started asking myself what my true potential is, and then this dismissive thought of what can I do became a challenge. It became, what can I do? What can I do with my life? What will I do with my life? Now, when I realized this, I feel like I really woke up to the first day of my life. I woke up to the possibilities of what I could do as an individual, and I decided to give up the life that I had for myself in Singapore. I decided to give it all up, and I wanted to dedicate my life to helping others. I wanted to learn more about poverty, violence, relief efforts in developing countries. And one of the major parts of this journey is what would take me to Nepal, now, Nepal's an incredibly beautiful country, and it holds a very special place in my heart, but it does have its fair share of troubles. So firstly, you take the fact that it just got out of a, a civil war very early in the 21st century, and you can still go to people's houses, and you can see bullet holes all over the walls from where innocent children and women were executed uh, by soldiers. You can go almost anywhere in Kathmandu or in the rural village areas and see the devastation that still to this day exists from a 7.8 magnitude earthquake that killed 8,800 people. So where I mostly dedicated my time in Nepal was working with an NGO about five hours north of Kathmandu in a region called Haibung. Now this was a region where almost all of the infrastructure, schools, houses, you name it, was destroyed by an earthquake. Now 
what made this interesting to me was not that we were just rebuilding the schools and the infrastructure, but we were innovating. We were rebuilding so that the next time the natural disaster hits, that the devastation would be significantly minimalized. Now, this is what happens when you bring together all these different types of people from different backgrounds. We bring together entrepreneurs, you bring together humanitarians, you bring together people who just want to make an impact. You forge all that together and you get a giant powerhouse of capability. And this was really, I think, a turning point for me when I realized how much of myself I could dedicate towards this direction. Now, we all know that there's three billion people in the world who live below the poverty line. I don't want this to necessarily be a talk where I depress you with statistics. But that being said, we are incredibly fortunate to live here in Australia, in this country that, as you can see on this map, we're not very, uh, we're not very challenged by a lot of global problems that exist in other countries. Now, I think we've become very numb to a lot of images like this that we see, where we see people who are in these situations and we think, oh, that's really sad. I really would like to help out, but you know, what can I do? When I went to India on my, it was my second day in India, and a woman walked up to me, and she was about this close to me, and she held her deceased baby in her arms, and she was begging me with tears in her eyes to give her food and to help save her baby, although it was clearly deceased. Now, if you can imagine what it's like to have that image come to life right in front of your face, the extent to which you see yourself as insignificant is destroyed. You finally wake up to the fact that you have it in your capability to help people, to save lives, to make an impact. This is a world that to us is very hard to imagine until you actually go there. For me, I could not have imagined it. It's something no one else could have, no one else could have imagined uh, in this particular society unless we lived in 13th century Western civilization riddled with plague and poverty and where most of our economic thinking was based on the concept of take, exploit, and enslave. Fortunately, though, we live in a very fortunate point in human history. It's really only been 0.1% of human history where this idea of helping others has really been mainstream thought. And as a result of that, I like to look at India because India is such an inspiring case to me. Where well, you've got 3 million registered NGOs in that country. These are not NGO workers. These are the actual NGOs themselves. That's the equivalent of one in every nine people in this country owning and operating their own non-government organization dedicated to solving the problems of their country. Now think about that for a minute. The appetite that exists to solve problems of Indians going out of their cities and out of their villages from whatever life they had, whatever their past was, doesn't matter to them. They just want to rise up and solve problems. The first challenge I want to put to all of you is that if they can do it, why can't all of us? Are we any more insignificant or significant than they are? Something else that's incredibly interesting to me is that as we're currently living in this fourth industrial revolution where we've seen the rise of uh, sharing economies, technologies, and the, sca uh, and the scalability of uh, solutions using technology, is it's extremely easy for almost anyone in this room to launch a technology startup for example. Now, Indians have taken this to quite an interesting level where just in the last year alone, there were 1,000 newly registered uh, technology startups in India that are leveraging the fourth industrial revolution to solve the problems in their country. Now, the appetite that exists towards solutions is so fascinating in India, and it inspires me because I think that if they can do it, why can't we? There are so many opportunities that right now, at this particular point in our existence of humans, we have to make our lives matter. Anyone in this room can launch a technology startup, as I said. Anyone in this room can go work with uh, an NGO in a developing country. If you want to wor work with Doctors Without Borders or the United Nations volunteers, there's nothing stopping you from going out there and helping those people, except for this false sense of insignificance that you, that you can't because maybe you don't feel you can. Maybe you don't feel like that life is for you. And if that life is not for you, it's still possible to have a comfortable life here in a place like Australia, or the United States, or where, wherever you may live, and uh, still be able to make an impact in this world. These particular startups that just came about because one or a few people had the idea that they wanted to make an impact 
where they saw that there were problems. Life straw is one particular example that I love referring back to because it's just a straw, right? It's just a little straw. The only difference between this straw and a normal straw is that this straw has a little filter in it, and this filter can block 99.999999% of waterborne bacteria. And when you look at uh, Kenya, for example, where a lot of people don't have access to clean water, it provided 600,000 people with access to clean water that previously would not have. And again, I'll reiterate, this is just a straw. This is because one guy decided to reinvent the straw to help people in a developing country. Even within the corporate world, there are limitless possibilities to make an impact, and a positive one at that. Regardless of what your role is, the next time you go into a meeting, there's nothing stopping you from raising your hand and suggesting the idea to dedicate resources towards something that you're passionate about, towards solving a problem, whether it's, doesn't matter what country it's in, doesn't matter what the cause is, there's nothing stopping you. And one example that I'll tell you about is Tesla. One day there was one person who had the courage in the middle of a meeting to raise up their hand and to say, how about, because we can only produce a very finite number of cars, how about we just license, uh, sorry, give away all of our intellectual property, all of our patents for free to everybody, and anybody can build the cars that we're building. Now, this may sound crazy to a lot of people, but this is what real impact is. This is how individuals, even in the most normal of lives, just going about their day in a normal job, can make an impact on the rest of the world. And as a result of them doing that, anybody, anybody can build an electric car to help combat climate change. I've talked to you a lot today about my life and about a lot of the beauty, hope, ambition, and really tragic ugliness that I've witnessed in my life, throughout whether it's my childhood, my travels, my career. I decided at one point to let this become my enlightenment, to let what can I do be a challenge rather than dismissive thought. Every single person watching this has had a very difficult life in some capacity. Maybe you resonate with my story, maybe you don't. Maybe you've had a more tragic experience, maybe you haven't. But there is nothing stopping you from waking up to the idea that you as an individual can choose to look at your past and your life and identify what you really care about, what matters to you, how that makes you the person that you are. Let that be your fuel, as it's been my fuel since I woke up. That has been my fuel to live every single goddamn day of my life with one purpose, to leave this world better than I found it. So now let me challenge all of you to ask yourselves, what can you do and what will you do? Thank you.